companies. So it's very relevant to the sort of thing that we're trying to talk about here. Um, Stuart's very much on the business side of things. He's got an MBA uh, and a Master's in Commerce from Macquarie. And he's worked in a range of locations uh, since I've known him in London, in Dubai, in Sydney, in this area of raising capital and uh, consulting and assisting high growth, uh, high value companies. Um, I will now basically shut up and pass this across to Stuart to talk about opportunities for early stage business raising capital in turbulent capital markets. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Simon. Uh, in other words, uh, Europe's uh, going pear-shaped. How do we get to get money to get businesses out there? Um, it's essential that it's the light to cover off today. Um, first thing, however, I think it's probably best if I introduce uh, us as a firm. Um, is this works as potential? Works as potential. Okay. Um, so we've got um, four principals. Um, Vincent Sweeney and Steve Lipskin founded the firm back almost 10 years ago. Um, both gentlemen are from a more of a what I call traditional um, corporate advisory um, chartered accounting background. Um, Steve went out into industry and has that sort of perspective of taking firms, um, particularly IT firms, from Australia and um, his key transaction, or one that he sort of claims fame to, is Visas, which he sold to an eventual subsidiary of IBM. Um, for around sort of 40 million uh, Australian dollars. Um, Mark Nesbitt is the uh, fourth principal. He's involved a lot in uh, the sort of IT space. Where we differ from firms like um, um, Starfish and the other venture capital firms is we actually um, work um, um, with the client. Um, we also tend to work with clients or the, the investee company a bit more sort of late stage once they're ready to actually perhaps um, get ready for a stock market listing. We do, however, also recognise that there is some value in actually playing with companies a lot earlier in terms of their formation phase, phase and stage. Not every firm is eligible for venture capital, not every firm is going to receive venture capital, but we typically work with sort of the investing companies to help them um, raise their probability of success of raising funds from both seed investors and perhaps some institutional investors or venture capital firms as we go through. Um, that's sort of a quick snapshot of what we do and sort of where we play in the market. To be quite honest, we're seeing more work in turnarounds and restructures and M&A activity than we are in sort of early stage growth businesses. It's a matter of the cycle, we can orientate ourselves to where the market heads, otherwise we simply won't survive ourselves. So that's sort of the key theme of, of today's talk, is to kind of keep oriented on the market and understand what's going on. Just a quick snapshot of some of our recent transactions. Um, to give you an idea of some of the firms we play with, uh, we like doing a lot of work in um, mining and services, more in the case of technology um, development and technology commercialisation rather than actually sort of the asset players of um, sort of pure exploration. Um, and mining resources is sort of the largest show in town if you're not sort of in terms of capital markets. If you're not part of it, then um, you can sort of find life sort of somewhat challenging. We also do work in uh, information technology. Um, we've mentioned some of those sorts of firms already and communications. Um, the other two areas that we're working in quite a lot at the moment is in medical devices, um, particularly in the orthopaedic space, as well as in uh, renewable energy. I'm um, doing quite a lot of work myself in sort of energy generation, particularly in tidal energy, uh, as well as uh, did some work a, a while ago in geothermal. So I'm happy to answer any sort of questions on some of those sort of sectors. So what I'd like to cover off um, today is uh, what's the impact um, of the capital market trends out there? What does this mean for us? Um, what does that happen in terms of you know, the environment for commercialising intellectual property? Um, what are these sort of investors, risk reward traders, and how do they actually evaluate businesses as, as they go through in terms of project viability? And then what are some sort of channels in the current climate to raise some funds? The key thing we're sort of experiencing right now is debt to leveraging. We're in the midst of an asset um, debt to leveraging asset. So asset devaluation, debt deleveraging cycle. So what that effectively means is that as of uh, 2008, global economies, particularly Western, European and American economies are contracting. The cycle that happens there is as asset values start to fall, there's a need to write off more and more debt. That then questions the ability to actually service your debt, you're in that sort of negative spiral that's going down. Um, the Spanish have finally um, put forward their mea culpa, um, but what we need to actually understand is, is 
what does this mean in terms of the ability for uh, investors, investees, who are typically yourselves with the superannuation funds going into institutions? Where does your money go? What's happened to that? Where do actually folks like myself try and tap into those sort of investment funds? Um, the key message that we're putting to our um, to the investor audience is now's the time to actually start investing through the cycle. Investing is starting to consolidate businesses rather than worrying about um, um, your top tier um, ASX businesses. Yes, you need that for a level of portfolio um, diversification in terms of financial markets, um, dumping your eggs in one basket, simple principle. But look at where some of the emerging market opportunities are going to come from. Invest through for a sort of five to seven year cycle rather than a six to twelve month position. So what we're sort of seeing here is some of the charts here um, looking at um, Spain's finally um, acknowledged its position. What will we see from Italy? Or will it be France in terms of the European contagion? So as one company starts to, or one country starts to um, um, seek bailouts, is that going to have a sort of a knock-on effect for the rest of the world? You're starting to see demand and economic activity in China start to slow down as well as demand for imports um, from Europe or exports, so Chinese exports to Europe, European imports from China slow down as well. So what they start to see is we're starting to sort of have some discontinuous change in, in, in the sort of economic order. Um, we're starting to see um, global power shift towards Asia, yes we know that, towards India, yes we know that. But what does this mean for folks who are particularly in Australia, some of the ageing economies, or some of the ageing economies in Japan and Europe, where people are ready for retirement, yet the retirement funds that they're looking for aren't necessarily going to be available. Interesting implications in terms of our ability to actually fund retirement as well as fund growing business. Um, in terms of Australian position, where do we sit into this? I was in a um, conference in Dubai um, the weekend before Lehman's Bank went, went, went under. And a Swiss German economist got up on stage and put up some very similar charts. And it was very fortuitous it was the week before Lehman's because he basically got up with a message and said, I've been in Dubai for um, those who have been in Dubai, so I've seen there was vast property development that's really not substantiated against market demand. Basically got up and said, I've been in this country for no more than five hours. And the city for more than five hours. He's driven up and down the highway, he's seen all the empty buildings, and he said, in true Swiss German style, you're in big trouble. He was a little bit less polite than that, but that was essentially his message. The key message that he put up there in some of these charts was debt to GDP levels. You see, Australia is in a similar situation of um, debt to GDP where um, not as quite as bad as the UK or the, U uh, the USA, but we have had a significant sort of spike where. Uh, our debt levels are around 150, through the top left hand chart, our debt levels are about 150% of our actual GDP. That means it's going to take all of our earnings, all of our activity to pay off one year's or one, one and a half years worth of all of our activity in the whole economy to pay off our whole debt burden. The interest bill on that can become quite astronomical. So, what you're starting to see is consumer behaviour. You'll hear out there in, 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 the, in the papers. Consumer behaviour is actually contracting and it's actually going back towards more saving. That means some real challenging times for our retailers, for our car manufacturers, for our tourism and hospitality operators. Places like Cairns in far north Queensland are in real trouble right now. That they're having significant unemployment, significant business closures, and significant back act, bank activity and actually foreclosing on, on loans and other services. services. You've then got other factors where there's a rebalancing effect of the Australian dollar rising. And so us as consumers who actually do want to go on holidays would actually rather go somewhere overseas because it's cheaper. So what you're also having in the same cycle is assets are actually coming towards the end of useful life. Places in, in, in we had some clients up in Cairns where we were actually trying to help them with um, some of their sort of tourism properties and they hadn't actually been invested in or upgraded for about five to ten years. They've been run by mum and dad operations, um, who are typically at, towards retirement age. And so all these factors starting to come together, we're actually going to see a further drop in asset values. What this means is that you know, these folks who are ready for retirement, who'd actually built up a whole portfolio of investment properties, because the bank had foreclosed, 
We'll live how you go. What, what about public debt? You've got private debt there, but what yeah. about government debt? Just a scary. But I mean, isn't that a bigger problem than, than this? Um, well, this is, this is a problem particularly just seen in, 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 in Europe. In Australia, yes, we are, we are building up level of public debt. Um, we've had a surplus, and that surplus went on some interesting initial short-term um, economic boost, but it has to actually really sort of recognise the significant challenges. Um, the public debt, as you point out, in, in Europe um, is the key driver where, um, if you look back through history, a lot of work that I've been doing around this, and it's an interesting question you've actually prompted a good thought there, that in 1929 and 1932, it wasn't the 29 crash that actually caused a lot of the devastation. It was the 32 crash that did. The, 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 the 29 crash was actually more of an economic financial markets exercise. The 32 crash was the real economy. A lot of the work that I've been doing and looking at some of these sort of macro cycles is with the view that once every generation, once every 80 years or so, um, give or take, um, Western societies go through this typical sort of cycle of massive economic growth fueled by credit. Um, that peaks out. There's a rapid downturn in the financial markets. There's a the next step down where it actually hits the real economy. And then what happens is a typical period of rise in youth unemployment. Someone then harnesses that. Um, energy through nationalistic fervour and results in various sort of military um, expeditions. You look back through, and there's uh, happy to sort of share some materials and some, some of this. <laughs> a major shift fight. Uh, a, major, a major conflict as a cleansing mechanism. So you look back through American and US American history, uh, and there's interesting observations from World War II, World War I was the warm-up match, to the Civil War, to the War of Independence, to the War of the Roses. Understand how generational cycles work through. Did you say the same thing in all of those? There is a pattern of intergenerational cycles. And an intergenerational cycle, but you say that even those... So each context is going to be different. There's going to be different geopolitics, there's going to be different economic circumstances, there's going to be different jokes in the pack, so to speak. But if you look through at generational cycles of one generation that survives the, the, the conflict, the next generation that grows up under, dare I say, government benevolence. The third generation, who's numerically smaller and has the similar value set to their parents, which was the first cycle through. It's generally the fourth generation that is the one that ends up being capital. Isn't that something we never learned from other states? <laughs> <laughs> Do you? Oh, I'd like to hope so. I'd, I'd like to think that my son wouldn't grow up. And it's interesting how that's at the individual level we hope that, but at a macro level of sort of the, 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 the difference of communities and populations and, and populace coming through, um, how that happens. You listen to a lot of the media at the moment and you've got this real sort of sense of entitlement on both sides of politics. Real entitlement mentality from the and the like, and a real entitlement mentality from the small business group. All blaming the government to actually sort them out. So that level of entitlement creates a level of sort of, dare I say, back pressure that then perhaps might lead to some sort of nationalistic fervor. Anyway, it's a view. Happy to provide some thoughts and provide some information and discuss. And that's how the financial markets work. It's a series of views on short or immediate, short and long-term perspective. And the market, in terms of the price setting mechanism, is just a simple clearance house for those views. Is the market perfect in that? No, not always. It's very much focused on short-term fear and greed. Anyway, some thoughts. What does this mean for um, the ability to raise um, private equity and venture capital funds? It means that uh, over the past three years or so, um, the ability to actually raise funds, and my apologies for the poor quality of this image, the general trend is downwards in terms of funds raised um, globally um, um, worldwide. The um, one that we're quite interested in is probably the buyouts and the venture funds. Um, we've seen, um, particularly in the second quarter of 2011, a significant rise in um, distressed private equity. So the vulture capitalists are coming through, trying to sort of harvest some businesses that um, can be sort of brought together, banged together, and some efficiencies gained, and, and bargain based prices. Um, 
what we're seeing though in terms of, of from our perspective, we're also looking at a number of the wholesale investors encouraging them to take a negative position in uh, what I would call cash flow positive businesses. Um, again, in this sort of market, what you're best off doing is looking for cash flow rather than for capital gain. Um, we have, in terms of the Australian um, um, context as well, um, the ability to actually tap into self and super funds. The real challenge there is that, um, again, for a portfolio reasons, you would not want to invest too much into one particular business. Which also leads to the challenge under the Corporations Act, and if you are actually going out to raise some funds, you can only raise um, $2 million um, from 20 people in a 12-month period. So that actually is quite restrictive in your actually ability to, to, to raise funding. Um, internationally, there's a range of different options around sort of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. I obviously have sort of different legislative uh, requirements for that. Other things that investors are looking at at the moment in the current climate is the ability to actually get liquidity. What happens if I panic and I want to get out? That makes it a real challenge for the private businesses to actually attract, to attract um, investment funds. There's typically 20-25% um, discount um, to, to valuations for a private business relative to a public one. But then the cost of actually being public sometimes can be quite prohibitive for firms that are actually not ready to, to, to be there. They don't have the stability in terms of the management team of operational cash flows and uh, operational processes. So, what's the value of your intellectual property? A great idea, pot of gold, is it that simple? Obviously not. Um, Simon can obviously attest to this one. I've seen on your presentations, you've attested to this sort of thing in the past. It's quite a challenging and entertaining journey. Um, one of the things that we've, we seek to try and make our Respective investing companies aware of is understanding competitive space. This is a um, competitive map from when I was at AAPT looking at uh, the introduction of a voice over IP uh, technology as a disruptor to um, the standard sort of public telephony network. We quite often have people come into uh, our offices and tell us we've got the latest and greatest technology, latest and greatest business proposition, and by the way, there's no such thing as competition in our marketplace. That has me very, very concerned. Because if you don't have competition, how does your prospective customer base currently solve their problem? If you don't have a prospective customer base currently solving your problem, do you really have a market? If you don't have a market, then you do really have a business. It's so that context of you might have some great and wonderful technology, but well, how is it currently being used or how will it be applied by your prospective um, customers? What is the problem they're going to try and solve with that technology? What about the first smartphone? The first smartphone? Well, there was no competitors in that, that market. It was the first, it was a new technology. Sure. But how else did we communicate? Sure, just for, for, for voice. Yeah. How did you communicate? Before a smartphone, how did you communicate? By voice, yeah. But I mean, I'm talking about the, the data. You had, you, had a, you had a series of technologies going through the wrong curve. You had the old um, non-smartphone mobile phones. You then had the old analog phones. Yep. So there was a way in which people could actually substitute. So you, you would call that a competitor? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Because there is a level of spin there that says there's a market that I can actually tap into with a vastly superior offer. That making sense? Yeah. So the other aspects in terms of the innovation space from a corporate perspective is understanding where they want to go. Do they want to grow into new markets? How do they go about doing that? That might be someone who's actually running a small business here in Sydney to actually then be able to actually run an office and operation down in Melbourne or Brisbane. Or for Australian businesses, how do we actually survive on, on international markets? Do we actually go to Europe and try and sort of capture some of the um, activity over there? Disruption, dysfunction, there might be opportunities for us. Or do we go into Asia, where there's actually a greater likelihood of growth with an emerging, emerging middle class? Uh, in terms of uh, innovation space, this perhaps comes to perhaps your question up there, of around evolutions of technology through their own technology, perhaps s curves that says you've got different generations coming through, solving the problem in a different way. Still addressing the same old market, 
civil market, but in, in a different way, in a different context. Um, the whole point that I want to make on this second chart here is that there's always choices. There's always scenarios, always choices. So when you're actually developing your commercialization strategy, understand what the potential scenarios and, uh, and, and options are. The value in this is that it actually understands how you actually sit down in negotiations and work out the best bargaining power and best valuation for yourself. I'm sure you've seen some very sort of feeling for your concepts um, in terms of innovation funnel and innovation process. Um, the process of actually going to, to market is actually um, a fairly rigorous one and we like to play perhaps in the proof of concept to market launch phase. Um, so we are aware of and do work occasionally with corporate clients just to help them get into the development phase. The research phase is not of interest to us. And so this is where I come back to that concept of if you don't have competitors, if you don't have a market, do you really have a business? Perhaps you're more appropriate in the, sort of the, the research of the phase. Um, the other thing I'd like to add to that is, is that the use of stage gates and the stage gate evaluation process helps um, us work with investing companies to build up their discipline of actually understanding market dynamics, market pressures, as well as operational performance considerations, as well as production, as well as scaling um, factors, as well as human sort of resources and bringing sort of the right people on to the project at the right time. Um, so, a simple due diligence framework. When we have people come pitching to us in terms of, yes, can you help us raise money in the capital markets and, 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 and let's sort of get out there and we've got the greatest, greatest, greatest business and it's a wonderful technology or it's a wonderful proposition or it's a wonderful whatever. This is a sort of a rough and ready sort of due diligence framework. Is it commercially viable? We typically like businesses that are actually cash flow positive and do have some earnings. Um, occasionally we do work with businesses that are a bit earlier stage, uh, particularly in terms of that sort of innovation pipeline. But we need to actually be able to see quite clearly that it has the ability to generate revenue, has the ability to scale it. So um, part of the challenge with uh, AAPT in terms of that competitive dynamics slide, the challenge that business had at the time was that it would probably cost a dollar to a dollar twenty to actually fulfil and provision every dollar of income it earned. I'll run that again. It costs you more to actually earn a dollar of income than you actually made. So, very quick way for business to go out backwards. Why was that? That is simply underinvested in the back-end technology, the billing systems, the operating systems to actually allow the business to, to survive. Rapid growth potential. Um, in other words, can we see it going into export markets quickly? Um, does it have the ability to, 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 to um, point out an example, be a discontinuous change, be a disruptive technology? Smartphones were disruptive technology to your roles of a Nokia clamshell type phones. They served a similar market, served a similar purpose, but they actually enabled the users to do so much more. So they're almost a disruptive proposition. You don't see too many of the old Motorola flip phones or the old Nokia sort of clam shell phones um, running around these days. It's more the Apple iPhone. And that's where the Apple iPhone uh, and others trying to follow it have actually stolen the base of the market. Um, investor readiness. This comes down to concepts such as um, the people you're investing in. Do they have a proven track record? Can they pay well with others? Um, quite often you'll actually see people who um, um, believe they have the latest greatest technology, but their ability to actually take guides and feedback from those people who are actually exposed to the market is somewhat limited. If you're not actually able to work with the team to actually make it happen, to actually pivot your business, particularly when um, things aren't quite working how you plan, if you don't have that level of flexibility, then you're actually quite a significant investment risk. Um, other issues, we need the IP obviously projected, um, that's sort of the standard. Um, no external conflicting claims. Um, the last thing that we need uh, when we're actually going to the public market listing is someone to lob a legal claim across um, the bowels of the business because that actually can quite significantly affect market sentiment in terms of actual valuations and where it's sort of going. You look at sort of Facebook, for instance, 
it's had a whole raft of claims coming through at the moment in relation to its listing dramas. I would suggest to you that some of the valuation that's been lost is in the mountains of the claims that are actually coming up against sort of business for that particular exercise. The other thing you do like to see is when you're actually going into a business, the bottom bullet point down there is the ability to identify harvest or exposition. You actually want to clearly understand who is going to likely um, buy this business. Trade sales are typically the most common exit opportunity. IPOs, occasional, but very rare. So who is actually going to buy this business and what valuation do they typically need? The same thing that I refer to in terms of understanding your customers for your actual product and your technology. Understand your customers and potential end buyers for the actual overall business at the same stage. Um, this framework is a Bell Mason diagnostic. Um, having done the MBA and all that wonderful stuff, these sort of things have jumped out and appealed. But what it talks through is a 12 point um, rating um, scale at different stages of business evolution. At different stages of its evolution, you want emphasis on different areas. At the early stage, you want emphasis and understanding on the market, the technology, and the management team. And the management team is also uh, the resourcing, so your people aspects. Over time, uh, you'll see greater emphasis on management team evolve. Um, you'll then start to see more of a push out towards your marketing, sales, and business development. Again, I'll come back to the point. It's much easier for us to actually raise investment funds for businesses that are actually starting to generate revenue than those that aren't. It gives investors a level of certainty over what's possible. It gives investors a level of certainty that the management team behind the business understand markets as well as technology. The view that actually convert ideas into cash. Um, so I want to run through sort of four key areas around you, what would you actually want to look at? Um, do you go for a sizable market opportunity? China is a clear example at the moment of where there's actually a rapidly growing market opportunity, particularly looking at the urbanisation of that country there. Not to suggest that we all drop tools and run off and try and find opportunities in China for us to do, but be aware of some of the dynamics that are going on out there. Look at the red dots and the size of cities growing. Um, compared to 2010 to forecast around 2020. You'll see that sort of areas around Beijing and Shanghai um, quite populous, and as you come down the coastline, further and further growth. You'll see some inland growth, but then, you know, what does that mean for the opportunities you're also trying, trying, trying to address? Is this the market you want to go after? Or do you want to go after smaller niches? These are sorts of questions you need to start to ask yourself as you're trying to take something out into commercialisation. Um, repeating a theme, I'm having a time by the way. No, it's not good. Repeating a theme, repeating a message. Um, proving business model through early stage customers. Uh, early stage customers um, enable you to define a minimal viable technology that actually gets things working. Um, I'm aware of many researchers who like to get things perfect on the bench, get it perfect in the lab. Yes, you might get it perfect in a theoretical conceptual sense, but is that what the market wants? Is that what the market needs? Get it to a point that get it out of the marketplace and have the market give you the feedback. So there's a period there where you straddle both the bench and the early stage market. In many sectors, there's large businesses, and pharmaceuticals is the classic. It does very really limited research and development on its own. It more manages its research and development through an innovation portfolio. By that I mean once the technology gets to um, phase two trials, it will then start to do incremental seed funding to phase it through the human phase three trials. That way it actually understands a number of different, it has a number of different bets um, on different technologies at different stages of development and, and, and execution. So what that says to someone who's actually trying to actually get business out there is take some potential early stage seed investment from strategic investors. The trick there is to get two to three seed investors on so that actually you can keep your options open. Um, not always possible, but ideally if you can get it. Um, if you are actually interested in this sector, I'd strongly recommend Eric uh, Rees' work around Lean Startup. He looks at um, 
taking the concepts of a minimum viable product and taking the concepts of experimentation, which I'm sure you're also familiar with in terms of the research um, environment, and actually then defining your market testing and market studies. Clearly, um, the market science is not going to be as rigorous as what you would have here in the lab, but it's the same sort of framework you actually want to go through. You actually need to get that balance between the market, the market demand, and the product offer and product solution, so problem solution, together before you actually then go to actually raising larger amounts of money. You've seen incredible wealth destroyed, particularly in the last dot-com boom and bubble, where great ideas which is simply not valid in the marketplace. And this is the interesting question around Facebook. What is its true worth? What is its true value? How are they actually going to go to the next stage and actually monetize their offer on the iPhone, on the smartphones? They're having some real trouble with that. So do they actually justify a valuation of $38 a share, $25 a share, $3.80 a share? Um, have they really got their market proposition right particularly in the light of rapidly changing market conditions. Um, the other key lessons that Eric really sort of looks at is around entrepreneurship. You know, it is a discipline. Um, accounting, yes, it's got to be done. Yes, you actually have to keep score of what's going on. Yes, you need regular information coming back to you to actually um, test or to actually observe the experience and the experiments and the tests you're going through. Um, and a key sort of principle he looks at is Build, learn, measure, and really sort of run through that sort of cycle. Um, this slide is coming back to my example earlier of uh, the life sciences and the pharmaceutical firms that manage an innovation portfolio. So down the left hand side you have your sort of pipeline. Down in the middle you have what I would call a, um, um, a portfolio management approach. At different stages of the technology as it's coming through, you might think it might become a core product, you don't really know, it's too early to tell, but you actually need to take an investment in this to actually advance to the next stage. Using the stage date process, you can actually sort of take technology through its different aspects and make a decision based on information as it comes through. You know what, this is not core to our business, we're going to let it go. Well, this is, so we actually want to actually bring it into place. Again, the key way in which many technologies get out of the university environment is through the trade, sale, and a strategic investment model rather through the IPO approach. Um, I don't know whether you've actually had anybody from the university commercialization offices speak. Three, three yeah. Ask them that question of how many, or what's the percentage of um, 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 firms that actually get out, or the, the percentage of intellectual property that makes it out into uh, the market through commercialization and a stock market listing versus a trade sale. And I understand it's, it's quite quite low, below sort of 10%. Um, don't quote me, but um, check the person too. But this is actually a model to understand from the capital markets and the commercial side how they'll actually evaluate your intellectual property and the process that they'll sort of go through. They're seeking to use what I would call real options to resolve uncertainty. So that is, that when this thing eventually is, is commercialised, there's a large payoff to us. But there's too much uncertainty to say, yes, it's going to go somewhere right here, right now. So how do you stage that through? Um, so real options is the model to sort of look through there if, if you're interested further. Um, the other concepts that I look at here is open innovation. Say, for instance, you've invested some money into a technology in early stage, yet you've realised it's not core to your business. You actually still capture value out of that through taking more of an open innovation model and actually collaborating with, with other firms, perhaps in other sectors, that can actually use what's, what's going on there. So the whole approach is you actually license and spin-off technologies that you've developed internally, or you've actually sourced in from, 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 from other research institutions. Um, but again, it's always having that market focus. Get it out of the labs, get it into the market, experiment with other people, incorpor to incorporate other aspects um, this is one that we're doing in the life sciences, orthopedic device technology at the moment. Um, so it's, it's, it's around the structure of a knee brace. How does that technology in terms of the knee brace structure work? How do you also then incorporate telecommunications and tele telemetry technology to actually be able to sort of report um, knee movement um, back to an orthopedic surgeon? There's some interesting things there that will be part of the technology or part of the, sorry, the product proposition that will evolve over time. That will 
eventually spin out of this particular project. Uh, some stuff we've done with the University of Wollongong. Uh, last area, channels to raise capital at the moment. Um, wholesale investor, ASOB, Sydney Angels, SimBC, and the one that I left off. Uh, and this is, okay, no, I'll put the key four ones there at the moment. Um, when you're actually going out to raise funds, the, one of the key challenges is actually distribution. Gone are the days of us corporate advisors having a little black book of investors and high net worths who are actually prepared to um, take what we say on trust and go on that basis alone and only. Um, yes, we still need that black book. Yes, we still have that black book. But the challenge in these current markets, and particularly the face of you know, the disruptive economic trends out of Europe, is distribution. Groups like Wholesale Investor and ASOP actually enable you to have a fairly sort of thorough distribution platform. Um, there are other sort of crowdsourcing models in the US that are actually a lot more advanced than, 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 than this. Um, and I'm happy to sort of share some of those experiences um, offline. But um, the key thing with, 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 with Wholesale Investor and both ASOP is you typically, um, from our side, um, work with an advisor who then actually sort of puts your materials up online properly uh, crafted information memorandum, uh, investor teaser, uh, investor presentation, and then um, the last one we typically have to back this up is a sort of fairly comprehensive financial model. The challenge you have then is to actually get how can you get this out to as wide an audience as quick as possible. Because yes, you know, there are some in, in competitive imperatives for you to sort of get that capital raising closed quite quickly. Uh, Sydney Angels, uh, and there are other angel networks around, are a group of um, early stage investors. They'll invest between twenty to $50,000 in a particular project, if they like. Uh, a lot of their efforts, however, are focused on, at the moment, what we call the digital media, social media um, propositions. Why is that? Is that a half-life of some of those sorts of businesses is 80 months to perhaps three years, in terms of it's going to actually get out there, grow rapidly or, or, or not. For an investor's perspective in the current climate, they're very short-term focused, which creates some real challenges for other businesses that we're working on, the technologies we're working on, particularly around renewable energy and tidal energy, which has another sort of seven to eight years of development to go through before it is actually sort of commercially operating. But in a business like that, you have a 20-year um, plus um, asset life of a, 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 a renewable energy plant. So there's those sorts of challenges that you actually need to sort of recognise and tailor your um, um, message to the rights to invest audience. Uh, the SIMBSC is a uh, junior stock exchange. Um, they're encouraging um, businesses to come on, particularly in um, the renewable space and increasingly life sciences, to come on a little bit earlier to address that liquidity or illiquidity premium that I referred to earlier. That from an investor perspective, I'm prepared to pay um, more um, or I'll only pay less on the other is the converse. I'm prepared to pay more if you're listed, I'll pay less if you're unlisted and I'm, if I'm not able to actually get the money out when I want. So investors will pay a premium for that level of sort of flexibility of the listing office. Um, I'll come back to the other thing that I've been mentioning before is the rising cash balances of corporates globally, particularly in Australia. Um, corporates in Australia hit the capital markets quite hard in 08, 09 to re proposition their balance sheets. They're now visiting the capital markets again, um, trying to raise money discreetly uh, with the intent of possibly further mergers and acquisitions, but also you know, to, to protect themselves against these, these, these short-term uh, economic challenges. The opportunity this represents, however, is if you can actually work with your rights to the partners, they do have some sort of cash balances available to actually discreetly invest in the rights of the project. To finish, some final thoughts. Um, Steve Jobs, the Arctic of Quality. Um, Barbara Sher was an interesting one that I found. Um, get out there and do it. And put on your nikes. Just do it. Um, the last one of everyone has a shower. Everyone who has a shower has an idea. Um, what are we going to do to actually make a difference in commercial markets? Thank you for your time. Um, questions? So, for a reason why the 
it's um, two actors are effectively an economic buffer, and a lot of them were having to pay down debt and refinance debt. Um, one of the key challenges we have in Australia is that it's probably not a well known fact, but um, in the lead up to the crisis, about 80 percent of our credit came from European banks. It now sort of floats between 40 to 60 percent in terms of credit. So you're actually your ability to tap into the capital markets and refinance your existing debt book in the current climate is quite a challenge. So you're actually raising sort of further equity to get your debt equity balance um, back together. If your asset values start to fall, it affects your equity position, not your debt position. Would, uh, uh, try and jump on a whiteboard or something. Um, somewhere here, to, to, to take the scenario, if this is your asset value, you then typically have what I would call here a debt position, then an equity position. If your asset value starts to fall, this bit comes off. It comes off here. So your equity is worth less. Your debt doesn't change. So you, in order to actually increase your asset value back up and to actually avoid breaching your loan covenants um, and avoid having the debt foreclosed, you raise cash to increase your asset, also increase your equity position. So they're actually trying to act as a buffer. They actually do need to do something with that excess cash they're building up. They do need to get some level of return on that. So rather than actually big bet, um, bet the firm type of investments, there is an argument that can be mounted for making a portfolio of incremental investments in other stage technologies. Does that answer the question or are we just having an excuse to just frame? Chris. <coughs> so it's sort of a semi-hypothetical scenario. Yep. Say there was a little cottage industry going on at the University of Sydney where yep. we had a, a widget yep. and we were, you know, we take it to different conferences and people were saying, gee, we quite like that, so we sell some to yep. other university laboratories, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody says, well, you know, I think this is actually quite an interesting opportunity. Apart from all the mechanics of whether you call the company or not, um, what would you say would be the best way to raise capital for an activity like that? Given that it's a little bit yeah, before sure. what, you know, the stage we're talking about here, but there are a couple of interesting prospects on the second to last slide. Yeah. Is there anything that sort of stands out for that kind of activity? Look, um, the approach that I will always go through is it's, 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 it's best to try and get some cash for customers. That starts the cycle. So you actually start to get that cycle happening through. It's then um, um, you would have typically your sort of seed investors coming through. The seed investors are typically new range investors. Um, from that, where do you actually find them? How do you find them? Um, the university um, commercialization officer, it's called the research. Sydnovate. Sydnovate. Sydnovate um, typically has a quite a good sort of its own little black book um, that would be appropriate for, for those sorts of. Um, potential investees, they may be either private investors or they may be um, some of the strategics. Um, the other option is to actually, rather than actually setting up as a um, standalone business, is to then sort of perhaps license out some of the technology. And so that way you actually then um, work on a sort of collaborative research um, space where you're actually doing some contract research um, through and with the university. Again, there's some good things and there's some interesting things around that. Um, you know, there's an NSI, New South Innovations, has developed an open innovation model, um, which says come and sign up for a four to five year um, research agreement. Um, the IP is yours. Um, it's probably about 5% that we're going to do a spin out with. Um, the IP is yours to do something with, but we actually want to sort of get some funding back through contract research. If you as an individual want to be the entrepreneur to go on out, then it's up to you to actually form the right sort of management team. Someone who understands markets understands the marketing and, and, and how to actually drive the revenue wheel and drive the, the, the sales and business forward. Somebody who understands operations, productions, process. Somebody who understands finance and then somebody who understands people. You might be able to get some overlap in terms of some of the people who are actually able to do some of those things. In general, as well as the, sort of the core technologists, they'd be sort of the, the four key roles you're looking for. I know I've sort of answered indirectly around your question, but has that given you enough? Uh, yeah, in the beginning you, you spoke about the general uh, economic uh, climate. Yes. Uh, 
from the point of view of an entrepreneur who st started a startup or wanted to start a startup, how would you like, analyze the general international uh, cli uh, economic climate? Yes, imagine right. imagine it's, yeah. the economy is good, would you rush to, to start uh, your own startup or would you like, wait for... I'll do it now. I'll do it now because the turbulence is affecting and disrupting legacy <laughs> business models. The key thing to think through is that um, and come back to my point around intergenerational trends. You've got particular dominant generations that have a certain mindset of the marketplace. For a range of reasons, that dominant mindset is now being disrupted by events outside their control, discontinuous change. So if you can actually appreciate and actually take a mid to long term view of around how this change is going to pan out, what are some of those scenarios, now's the time to actually get out there and do it. Now's the perfect time because it's real change. In mature markets, things stabilise and solidify. Disruption, but the two months. Can I get your perspective on all this uh, media coverage lately on uh, the tech flight to Silicon Valley? Yeah. Um, it's a very limited sector that they're looking at. They're looking at digital media. Um, they're looking at those sorts of sort of kick, tip and flip type investments. Um, there's a lot of hype over there in Silicon Valley, there always has, there always will be. Um, so, you just recognise the hype for what it is. The other thing in, in terms of the Australian investment and Australian capital markets is resources. Very much the focus on resources. There's something about a man, a Kelpie, an SD and a shovel that gets the Australian investors celebrated. <coughs> I don't know why it is. It's the Kelpie. <laughs> So to kind of pick a shovel and a, a, a Kelpie is what gets... But is, is that an insurmountable uh, you know, barrier for us? I mean, we're always going to run into that. Look, I, and Simon and I um, have regular chats on this. Um, it's a regular bit, bit beverage session. And it's something to do with serial entrepreneurs. What has got the momentum going in the US, particularly in Silicon Valley, are serial entrepreneurs. They've been there, they've done it once, they understood what it takes, and they're now prepared to give it a go again. And you know what, the first time I did it, it took me 10 years, the second time it took me 5 years, this time it's going to take me 3 years to put down. That's sort of that attitude and mentality and approach that comes through from the serial entrepreneurs. And they actually enjoy the space of creating something. And actually able to recognise their ability to work with other people. There's a real limitation from many Australian investors is that I've invested in So inventors, I've invented this, I've created this. Therefore I've got to protect my whole time. Sure, you've got 100%, you've got 100% of very little, almost nothing. Get it out there, let it fly. The analogy that I would have, um, out of my sporting background, is why we're kiting, started kiting. In dynamic turbulent environments, the best thing you can do is actually set a direction and then go quite aggressively towards that. But then you always continue to reevaluate what you're doing. Um, a lot of the, the Australian economy, large corporates, is what I would call a rowing out on flat water. Optimise for efficiency and scale, and therefore maximum output, but on fairly passive, stable conditions. As soon as those conditions start getting a bit more turbulent, where's your rowing aid? Other questions up to that? Yeah, no. okay. right. I, I got a couple of, sort of questions. <laughs> I, yeah, I knew you were know me. Um, there was one slide that you put up there. Firstly, I, I was a bit concerned about this idea of innovative accounting. Um, it's not creative accounting. There's a difference between innovative and creative. Uh, could you just explain what you mean by innovative accounting in that context? Yeah, sure. Um, innovative accounting in that context is the ability to actually validate your experiments. So what does that mean? It means rather than just actually getting straight down to uh, what we call your raw sort of profit and loss numbers, it's understanding what are the key drivers to your business model? So, how many, um, for instance, if you're taking a digital media business, how many hits on your website do you need before you actually convert to a sale? So, what are those sorts of metrics of different layers of the business that actually can convert into um, the performance results? What is it in terms of customer satisfaction? What is, it, what is it in terms of total quality management in terms of your production side of things? So, it's understanding those, some of those sort of key drivers of different layers of business. 
Creative accounting, yeah, there's been far too much about the financial markets. Mm -hmm. Let's leave that alone. Okay, uh, that, that's why I was just going to think there's a difference between the two and understanding. Um, you also mentioned the issue of crowdsourcing. Yeah. How does that affect in Australia, given this limit? In the same sense in the US, it's what Facebook had to go out. Mm. They had to be investors. The same in, the, in Australia, except the numbers are so much smaller. I think. Correct. Is that a problem for trying to do crowdsourcing for more than you know, the 30 or 40 level within Australia. Do you run into ASIC? It's a very real problem. If you start to do... It's a very real problem. It's a very real problem. Um, the Corporations Act and, and, and the um, Section 708 rule uh, is built to protect retail investors, like punters, so to speak, um, from the various sort of folks who actually managed to take their money in the White Shoe Brigade and with the Perth miners and all sorts of other sort of characters running around. Um, it does make it quite difficult for um, businesses who might have a great following um, to actually tap into that following for investment. Um, the only way it's actually possible to do it is effectively a gift. It's not a non-tax deductible gift and that really doesn't work for people, so why don't you do it? The only way you actually can do it is to become effectively a customer of that business which is some of the sort of challenges we address. Um, so yes, I'm hearing a policy paper from Simon to um, to Canberra. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. I, I, I shall read his interest. Okay, any more questions before we finish up? Yeah, Actually, um, I just want to add it. Actually, Simon, you can answer that. Um, yeah, it's just So, let's say I've sort of started off the, the small business uh, finance from my own yep. sort of home funds. When, what sort of advice would you have? When is the step when I actually should try to get uh, other external funding. External funding. Yeah. Like, should I be uh, first have like a revenue stream? Uh, the sooner you think like a public company, the better, because it actually starts to fix your mindset. So if you have a advisory board around you, and people who are actually prepared to catch up once a month, and you buy them dinner, or they don't have to buy you dinner, depending on how early the business is, um, who are prepared to actually um, buy into your vision, um, the sooner the better you can actually get that high-end capability behind you, the better. From there, um, you typically go through the sort of the stage, I'm sure some probably have learned this before, of friends and family, friends and family to fools round, um, or, or, or angels, that's typically your seed round. Um, you would then typically come to us at a, probably what I'd call a sort of a series A, um, series A round, where you've actually got some revenues in your hourly to sort of try and scale the business. Um, we do like to help companies at that early stage, but more from an advisory perspective that says, look, help us, we need to help you understand what the end goal is in terms of the scale of the business. But let's work backwards through proof of scale, proof of market, proof of concept. So if you've done your first raise and you're sort of working through that proof of concept, you've actually got some customers paying you money. And you can actually clearly articulate your pathway, proof of market, proof of scale proof of rapid growth in terms of export markets, then yeah, that's the sort of stage we're sort of coming around that sort of proof of concept, proof of markets. Do we really go to capital markets for that? We still have business. Um, far too many people have gone that I've got a great idea. Why won't venture capital invest in me? Well, is your idea that great? Is it that unique? Is it that different? Is it going to actually going to give me the returns relative to everything else that's out there? The other point that I did make, um, just reminded in terms of the impact of the economic downturn, is depressed asset valuations means you've actually got some really, really good businesses going quite cheap in the public markets. So that's the competition you have as an early stage investor, as an early stage business trying to raise money. Okay, well that's really very interesting <coughs> presentation with a lot of points, a lot of different views that we haven't seen in this environment before. So could you please join me in thanking Stuart once again. Okay, um, just I was asked to uh, outline the forthcoming talks that we've got over the next few weeks and I finally managed to nail a few people to speak to the floor. Um, in two weeks time is a guy called Ian Maxwell. Um, Ian's uh, PhD was in chemistry. He was in chemistry department I started at Sydney Uni 20 years ago. Um, he's worked in a number of corporate environments, James Hardy and um, Mentech and companies like this. 
He is currently CEO of a company called VT Imaging, uh, which is a spin-off from University of New South Wales, where he's actually taken some imaging technology out of the uh, department there, raised venture capital, and, and started that. He's on, I think, uh, trying to raise a Series C round in this at the moment, based out in Surrey Hills. Really interesting little company. Um, that would be a very interesting talk. He has a lot of, um, shall we say, personally highly held views that he'd like to espouse to people. Um, so that would be a very interesting one. Um, two weeks after that, we've got Mark England. Uh, Mark is known to some of the people around here. He's the uh, former CEO of uh, Redfern Optical Components, now Tycom. Um, he's, again, another Sydney graduate. Uh, he'll be talking about the experience of um, the Redfern, one uh, of the Redfern companies, basically, from its start through to the successful sales of Tycom, uh, Tyco Subcomma, uh, late last year. And then two weeks after that, to round off the series, um, we have around our lead with Bart, who's the commercialization manager of Sydneyfate. Um, Stuart mentioned the, the role and the, the uh, fact that these guys need to be involved when something's coming out of the university. That is absolutely true. Um, it's a really good idea to understand how those guys think, what they do, what they see as their role in life. Uh, Randall's um, an interesting guy. He's done the startups. He's uh, risen South Africa. He's done a couple of startups. Uh, one, at least one of which was successful. He was at NICTA, uh, involved in the spin out of the Open Kernel Labs, which has been a very successful spin out from there. Uh, and he's now been basically looking, out, looking after the sort of spin up startup activities within um, Sydney. So, again, it should be an interesting talk. Okay, thanks very much again. Oh, was that a question, Eric? Sorry. I assume there's a date uh, June, July, rather than May. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, sorry. I threw this together very quickly. So I'm, I'm a month out, but that's that's the Wednesdays, okay? So the Wednesdays, the, I had it wrong, I had it wrong in the head before, so it's that. So. I will I'll put it on the website. Put it on the website and send out the emails. This time. Okay, um, so um, that's it, and that's time to get some pizzas.